Hope you're all doing well. Uh, I'm deeply conscious I stand between you and a break. Um, and my uh, initial confession is I am not a designer. I'm an appreciative amateur. So uh, please bear with me. Um, Why well, am I here? I run a business called Cubic Transportation Systems. And we're the leader in payment and information systems for transit authorities and transportation authorities around the world. You may, um, if you visited London, you may have used the Oyster Card system. We're the business that does that, and we do systems all around the world like that, like the Opal card in Sydney, the Compass card in Vancouver, the Venture card in Chicago, and the Metro card in New York. And I'm pleased to say, just yesterday, we were awarded by the New York MTA a billion dollar contract to provide the next generation system for New York. And I, I want to hook, hook into this um, conference here. Our bid for the New York City contract was supported by DD Studios in Carlsbad. So I want to give a big shout out to Tracy Manning and her team. <laughs> DD Studios did some terrific work um, on the design concepts for our next generation of de devices that will be fielded. And those of you that traveled to New York City or happen to live in New York City, in about 18 months' time, you'll start to see some new equipment uh, come into the, ci the city's transit system, and that the design work behind that was from DD Studios. So thank you again, Tracy and team. But let's talk more broadly about transportation and what's going on in the world and how it might affect how we all move around our cities. And one of the one of the biggest trends is people are looking to live in cities more. You know, ninety percent of the world's population, or sorry, the U.S. population, is going to live in cities by 2030. And if you went back to 1950, that number was south of 50%. And you know, all of the population growth around the world is occurring in urban areas. And the ramifications for transportation are obvious, right? We're going to have more population density in these core urban cities. And um, millennials are looking to live in cities and work and be able to travel to work without needing to drive a car. So the, implications for transportation are immense. In addition, we're changing the way we pay for stuff. And initially, you may wonder, well, what is, what's that got to do with transportation? Well, you know, when I grew up in the south of the UK, one of the things that I would do at the weekend is I would ride the bus into the city center, and I'd spend the day in the town center shopping and hanging out with my friends. So I had journeys during the weekend to do that, I used to ride public transit to do that. People aren't doing that anymore. They're doing their shopping online. And one of the things they're doing is they're having those packages from that online shopping delivered to their work during the weekday. And so the implications for transportation in cities is you're taking journeys that used to occur at the weekend, which generally is a less congested time, and you're actually transferring those because of online shopping into transportation that's occurring during the weekday the busiest periods for transportation in cities. And if you think about big cities like New York or London or Sydney, you now have all of these vans that are driving around delivering Amazon packages to offices for all of our online shopping, and they're stopping on the street, they're blocking lanes, they're taking up parking spaces, and it's actually a pretty big issue for major cities. One of the positive developments is the sharing economy uh, through applications like Uber and Lyft and even bike sharing schemes. Essentially, these systems are producing additional capacity because they're helping, helping increase efficiency by pooling journeys and having a better utilization of capacity that exists. So that's a great trend in terms of easing some of the congestion that's coming from uh, you know, urbanization, population growth, and this transition in the way that people uh, shopping. One of the other trends is electric vehicles. Now, this is a great trend for the environment. It is not a good trend for how infrastructure gets paid for. The majority of the infrastructure in the United States, and actually in most countries around the world, the road infrastructure, is actually paid for by gas taxes. And electric vehicles are not good for gas taxes. Uh, because obviously they use less gas, right? And actually the projection is by 2025, the deficit in the Highways Trust Fund, which is what pays for 
all of the roads and the, the, and the infrastructure we use to travel around, the deficit is going to be at 205 percent. And uh, one, of the con one of the causes of that is electric vehicles. So we're going to have to figure out a different way to pay for the infrastructure um, that we all use uh, to travel on. And one of the other uh, implications of electric vehicles is, of course, the charging infrastructure. Where are we going to put the infrastructure that we're going to use to charge these cars? One of the other big trends with the, with the vehicles is something called connected car. And the, the, the idea here is that the car can talk to infrastructure, cars can talk to one another. And the implications for safety are really quite profound as well. You know, a car can talk to the car in front, the car in front can tell the car that's traveling behind it that it's slowing down, it's going to break, and the car can actually take action without the driver needing to do so. So the safety applications are very interesting from connected vehicles. One of the other more interesting um, applications of this technology is in traffic management. So at the moment, most of the, most of the way that cities manage how traffic flows around the city is kind of based on a request. Right, there's signs, they may be fixed signs, they may be dy dynamic uh, message signs, but they basically say, hey, this road's congested, would you mind using this road? And the driver will decide whether they actually want to follow that sign and go the alternate route, or whether they're just going to carry on and do what they want. When the traffic management system in a city can actually talk to the car directly without needing to communicate to the driver, it can actually become more of a... a demand-based system where the traffic management in the city is actually preventing vehicles from actually taking certain routes because perhaps there's been an accident or there's congestion on those routes. And then, of course, one of the most talk talked about things is the driverless car. And um, the driverless car is potentially a significant development in terms of increasing productivity. If you could imagine that you could travel to work in your own private vehicle and during that time, rather than concentrating on the road, you can actually work. The car's driving itself, you can catch up on email, um, you can perhaps do some online shopping and congest the city through the freight that's being delivered. Um, but you know, one of the things that uh, driverless vehicles are going to do is they're going to change the way that cities are designed. Uh, because you can imagine, if you think about downtown San Diego and you look at how much of the downtown real estate is dedicated to parking. But one of the great things about driverless cars is they don't necessarily need to stop in the city anymore. You take your driverless vehicle into the city center, it drops you where you want to go, and then you send it back either to your home or you send it to a parking lot that's outside of the city, and then when you're ready for it, you call it back, and it comes in, and it picks you up. So you think about all of that real estate in cities that it can now be turned into residential areas, areas where people can uh, mingle and socialize. You know, the, the potential disruption to the way that city space is used as a result of driverless cars is quite phenomenal. You know, one of the things that people aren't quite sure about, though, is are they actually going to help with congestion? Because you know, if people are using these cars, their inbound journey that's just the same volume of journeys as they do in a car they drive themselves. But that return journey home that it does on its own without you in the car, that's an incremental journey. So is that going to be, is that going to be a cause of further congestion, or is that actually counterflow movement and won't actually matter? And no one's really fully figured that out just yet. But clearly, driverless cars are going to change the way we travel, and they're going to change the way cities are developed. So we talk about congestion, and lots of people think about um, congestion, and they think, well, build more capacity. Well, the truth is we don't actually have a problem of capacity. We have a problem of, dem of peak demand. Actually, during periods of the day and at the weekend, there's actually more capacity than we need on transit systems and roadways around the world. But the big problem is everyone wants to travel at the same time. And you know, building additional capacity to address that peak demand isn't efficient. And um, you know, I mean, interestingly enough, it takes about 13 years to build a new railway line. Generally, on average, in the state of California, from start to finish, it takes 13 years to build a new railway line. So that's not a particularly rapid way of addressing this peak demand problem. 
And there's actually some studies been done on building roads. Maybe you know, if rail takes that long, just build another road. Well, there's actually a theory called traffic speed equilibrium, which is if you build another road, let's say, let's say on, a, on a roadway the average travel time is 30 miles per hour, and you build another lane, you raise the travel speed up to 40 miles per hour because of the additional capacity, well, more people are going to notice that it's quicker to drive, and they're going to drive on that additional road that's been built, and they're going to bring the traffic speed back down to 30 miles per hour. So building additional capacity doesn't work. Actually, what we need to do is figure out how to get people to either travel at a separate, different time uh, from when the peak demand is occurring, or to pull their journeys in such a way that the capacity that already exists is being used more efficiently during that peak period. And you know, this matters because transportation and people's ability to move around cities for work, rest, or play is absolutely critical to the economic vitality of a city. In 2013, congestion cost the US economy $124 billion. And um, that's just a phenomenal amount of money. So we're going to have to change the way people are traveling, as I, as I mentioned before. And you know, the way we're going to need to be able to do that is through the application of these different modes, like the sharing economy, as well as through technology, making it easier for people to find their way onto alternate modes of travel, and maybe perhaps using the payment system to either incentivize or deter people from traveling at those peak periods. No matter what you think about government, uh, they have a major role to play in this. You know, that, that cost of congestion, $124 billion, um, that's a really significant issue at a local, state, and federal uh, level of government. But one of the biggest problems is these guys are moving slower than the technology companies are. You know, look at the various different battles that are going on with companies like Uber in cities around the world, where Uber, using technology, came up with a new model for service delivery introduced it into cities, and then city governments and national governments scratching their head, thinking, what do we do about Uber? And actually, the posture of cities to Uber is different. In London, uh, where I come from, Transport for London recently canceled Uber's license and prevented them from offering services because they didn't feel like they adhered to certain regulations for private vehicle services in, in London. But that decision came way after Uber actually introduced the services. So uh, government have a really, really important role in terms of organizing transportation, making sure mobility of cities works well. But they need to figure out how to address policy and regulation much quicker given the pace of technology. The other thing is with these, with these services, um, and I don't mean to overuse the term Uber or Lyft, but with these new services that are popping up, bike schemes, Uber, so on, we're actually getting more and more modes of transportation appearing in cities, which is great because it's giving us more choice. But the, the problem is we don't generally just use one service to travel. We have a journey. We go from A to B. And in the process of using, uh, making that journey, we may use multiple services. And at the moment, the, those services are not necessarily integrated. You have an Uber app, you might have a transit app, you may have a bike sharing app to get the code to unlock your, your bike, but they're not integrated and help you actually make a journey A to B. And that's something that we need to solve. So at the moment, transportation in cities broadly looks like this. You've got a bunch of corridors that lead into an urban center. You may have some buses running down those corridors, depending on which city or region you live in, you may have trains running into the, into the urban area, but you've got a bunch of cars on roads coming into the city centers, and then in the city centers itself, you've got cars, you've got, you've got vans, you've got buses, you may have a subway system if you're in a big city, but there is a bunch of congestion on the, those roadways coming into the city and in the urban core itself. In the future, I think it's going to look something more like this. I think what we'll see is we'll have ride-sharing services like these orange vehicles that are taking people from their homes to the major corridors. And then on the major corridors, you're going to have much more efficient, more densely utilized vehicles like commuter rail, like bus rapid transit, that's actually bringing you into the city center. 
In the city center itself, you're going to have more walking and cycling. There'll be more what we call active transportation, actually moving around the city center, partly made possible because of that reduced footprint of parking and the additional um, recreational space that will create. I think the, within the city center, you may have more, more densely provided transit systems like subway systems in big cities. And in other cities, you'll have more of these autonomous pods that are actually shared vehicles that are moving around the city, take, picking someone up, dropping them off, picking someone else up, and dropping them off. And this will be a much more efficient use of, of space. And cubic transportation systems and our role in providing payment and information systems, in order to address a lot of these trends that I've been talking about today, we've actually created a vision called Next City. And the idea of Next City is basically an extension of what we've been doing in transit for over 45 years now in providing a single payment system that brings together journeys on bus, rail, and ferry, but actually taking the payment system, creating a single account that actually brings together and creates that integration I was talking about earlier, so that you may call an Uber, you may ride a bike, you may drive your car, you may park your car, you may ride transit, and that entire journey will actually be paid for through one payment system, which will be frictionless, and you won't need to have all of these various different apps and cards and so on to make that journey. You just have a single cloud-based account that will process that entire journey for you. And through the transactions that the system creates, it will actually get to know your journey patterns better and actually help route your journeys in the most efficient way and proactively notify you, hey, here's the best way to travel. And in the aggregate, it's going to provide government agencies tools to actually manage the demand for transportation and the utilization of the transportation network a lot more efficiently. And with that, as they say from back home, cheers. Thank you.